Super quick backstory, I've been using the modern version of Angular since it came out, and I had been using AngularJS for maybe a year or so before that. So shortly after the release of Angular 2, I wrote a book for Ionic developers who wanted to build applications with Ionic and this new version of Angular. That book contained five example apps, and I've been keeping that book updated for five years and the example apps along with it. So that brings me to the point of this video. Uh, this situation has created an interesting way to compare how my coding style has changed over the years. So I've kept the applications in the book up to date with new versions of Ionic and Angular and have modernized them somewhat, but I've kept the general approach more or less the same over the years. And now I am completely rewriting these apps from scratch exactly how I would build them with everything that I know today with no effort to keep the code base consistent with previous versions or to leave out more advanced concepts in an attempt to soften the learning curve. So I have one application that, although it's been updated and modernized somewhat for recent versions, it uses more or less the same coding style that I was using when Angular 2 first came out. And now I have another application that does the exact same thing, but rewritten in a way that utilizes what I think is a best practice approach to building modern Angular apps today. So we're going to take a look at the key differences between these two code bases and hope that I've learned a thing or two over the past five years. And it's also worth noting that I don't think the before code I'm going to show you is bad. I think it's a perfectly fine way to code an application, especially one of this size. There is just room for it to be optimized and improved with more advanced concepts and techniques. So just for some context, here's a look at what the application looks like. And both code bases create more or less the exact same result. So the basic idea is that we can add a checklist and then we can go into those checklists and we can add individual items to that checklist. We can mark off items as being complete and we can also reset the state of all the items by clicking the refresh button. And then we also have uh, editing and deleting data and stuff like that. And then all of this data is persisted in storage. So if we refresh the application, all of our data is going to stay there. So I'm going to focus on showing you some key differences between these two code bases. I will briefly touch on the basic idea behind the concepts I'm going to mention, but I want to keep the comparison reasonably short. So I've done separate videos on all of the concepts I will mention. So just check the links in the description if you want a deeper explanation on anything. And I've set up one of the code bases here. This is the before one, the original one. Uh, this has this red color and the new one has uh, the blue color. So you can sort of keep track of what we're actually looking at. So the first thing we're going to look at is the use of smart and dumb components. So in the original code base, you will notice that each page in the application is just a single component. If we take a look at the home page, for example, we can see that everything needed for this page is defined right here in this template. And the same goes for the checklist page as well. If we look at it, uh, everything is just all in this one template. Now for this application, this really isn't that big of a deal in terms of code organization. Uh, this template is not overly complex and the Ionic components are doing a lot of the sort of heavy lifting for us anyway. However, this does somewhat hinder the ability to utilize on push change detection, uh, which every component in the new application is making use of. So in the new example, if we take a look at the same pages, we'll be able to see that the list that I'm displaying on the home page has actually been refactored out into its own dumb UI components. So I'm utilizing the concept of smart and dumb or presentational components here. So the parent home component, which is a smart component, handles all of the coordination, uh, dependency injection, uh, data fetching, and so on. And the dumb UI component just receives simple inputs and primarily communicates with the parent smart component through its outputs. So basically all we're doing for this dumb UI component is we're having our smart parent component pass in the list data to it as an input. And then we're just displaying this list in this component. And when this list is interacted with, we are creating some output events as well. So this dumb component doesn't need to know anything about injecting services, fetching data, 
or what's going on in the rest of the application. And I've done the same for the checklist page as well. We have a dumb UI component there. And I also have this shared uh, form modal component that I have abstracted out as well. So this is another dumb UI component that's responsible for displaying uh, this form and both the home page and the checklist page can utilize this form and they can also supply their own inputs for the form. So if I wanted different fields, I'd be able to do that on a per component basis as well. So again, for more information on the subject of smart and dumb components, uh, check out the link in the description. So the next notable thing is the general structure of the project. So before I would use the rather common approach where things are separated by type. So this isn't super noticeable in this application because the structure is still reasonably simple, but all of the components would be in a single folder. Uh, all of the uh, pipes, for example, directives, all the services are just in one folder. So basically we have these high level folders and then they hold everything of that type. But in the new code base, I have separated everything by feature. And one of the biggest benefits of doing this is that related code is co-located, uh, meaning it's in the same place. So if we take a look at the checklist uh, page or feature, for example, this uh, feature has a service that only it uses, this checklist item service. So rather than living off in its own uh, services folder at the root level of the project, like in the previous example, in this case, it just lives within the checklist feature. And so we have its UI components as well. They all live within this uh, same feature folder rather than again, being off in its own uh, component folder along with everything else. So generally any code related to this checklist feature in the application is going to be located within this one folder and it makes switching between those things much quicker. And generally, if I'm working on this feature, these are the files I'm gonna be switching between. And it also helps to create a sort of mental model and understand, okay, this is more or less everything that is going on with this feature. And then for anything that isn't specifically related to this feature, if it's shared throughout the application, then I have this shared folder as well. So I'm also using this NX style folder structure that organizes features further by splitting things up into a feature data access UI and utils folders. So you can see here with the checklist, for example, I'm using data access and UI. But again, I won't talk too much about that here. Uh, I have an entire video dedicated to using this NX style structure in Angular. So I'll link to that in the description as well. So the next big difference is a preference for declarative style code over imperative style code. So this one is hard to summarize. And again, it's something I've talked about in more depth elsewhere, but the general idea is that with a declarative style, you describe what you want on a more human level. And with an imperative style, you say how you want something to be done on a more computer algorithmic step-by-step -step sort of level. So in an Angular context, declarative code often means utilizing the template, whereas imperative code will write out some explicit procedure to do something in the components class. And that's not like a definite rule or anything like that. It's just an example of how it commonly pops up in an Angular situation. So let's take a look at a specific example of what this looks like in this application. So in the previous version of the application, I'm relying on these alerts built with the Ionic alert controller to get the data I need for creating a new checklist or editing a checklist. And so you can see I have a couple of those here. So this involves coding in an imperative style. I am writing out code to create this alert manually and then manually triggering when I want to show it. So this is something that I consider to be a more imperative style, at least compared to the uh, alternative I'm about to show you. But I think the terms are still very vague and gray, at least to me, maybe somebody can do a better job of explaining it. Because even though I'm referring to this as being imperative, it is uh, still somewhat of a declarative style. For example, calling alert controller dot create, supplying options like header message, and then calling a method called present. Uh, this is all very sort of human like language. We're not in here manually creating DOM nodes, for example. But I do think the alternative that I'm about to show you in the new application is a lot more declarative. So in the new version, what I am doing instead 
is I am using the ion modal component and this has the benefit of being able to be implemented directly through the template rather than having to use a controller and writing code for that in our components class to create it. So I can just dump the ion modal in here and then I have this is open property hooked up to the value of an observable stream that controls when to show and hide that modal. So one big benefit here is that I'm then able to remove all of those uh, methods that I was using before in the, the previous example, the code in this checklist page class is quite a lot more involved, whereas my new components class is much simpler. Now I am still using an alert elsewhere in this application on the, the homepage, I think. Yes, I'm creating an alert to confirm someone wants to delete something before actually deleting it. So again, I don't think there's anything wrong with this you know, approach of using a controller or even using imperative code, that's fine. I think the more declarative approach in general just makes things a lot simpler. And in a broader sense, I think declarative style code is also less error prone. So the next big difference is reactive coding. So both of the apps use observable streams and RxJS, but the newer code base takes a more reactive approach. So this is a topic I've talked a lot about recently. So again, I'll link to some more info about that. But when I say reactive coding, I specifically mean the reified reactive approach where we typically compose streams together and make use of the async pipe in the template rather than manually subscribing to observables in our classes and handling the data imperatively. So as you can see in this before example here, I am manually subscribing to the stream from the checklist service. And then I'm setting up this uh, checklist class member for the checklist data that is returned. And then I'm using the data from there. And I'm also using an ng on destroy to unsubscribe from that stream. But now in the more recent example, I'm creating a single view model stream with all of the data I need for the template. And this includes the data from the checklist service that I was just talking about. And then I subscribe to that stream in the template using the async pipe wherever I need to use it. So basically this one stream here, this view model stream defines everything that is going to be used in the template. And so what I like about this more reactive approach specifically in this example here is it makes it a lot more clear for only utilizing this one view model we're not sort of having all these uh, additional sort of flags and other class members that we're storing data on, which we're making use of in the template. We of course don't need to worry about unsubscribing or anything like that because the async pipe is going to handle that for us. And it just creates this really clean and easy to manage approach where if any of this data changes, it's just going to cause a new value to emit on the stream. Our view model is going to be instantly updated with the new values and our template is going to automatically display those values. And it also makes it easier for us to make use of this on push change detection, which is going to improve the performance of the app as well. So at a glance, this might seem more complex and maybe it is there is i guess some additional concepts you need to learn in order to be able to do this but it is also hard to make a one-to-one -one comparison here because i've refactored other things and i'm also including those in this view model so it makes it look a little bit more intimidating especially if you aren't familiar with this uh, approach and the last big difference is tests the new application has a little over 100 unit tests, which we'll see uh, here in a moment. And I also have 12 end-to-end -end tests defined as well with Cypress. So even though this is just an example application and I won't be using it to teach testing concepts, that's not a part of the beginner to intermediate level course this belongs to. I still developed the entire application with TDD, test driven development. Uh, the old version of the application did not have any tests. So the main motivation for using a strict TDD strategy for this example application is because I think TDD helps me create better quality applications. And although this is just an example app, it is also code that I intend to keep maintained for a long time. 
with any luck, hopefully for at least another five years. So if you've been watching any of my recent videos, then maybe you are already sick of me rambling on about testing. So again, I'll link to another video that focuses on that. Uh, the video I'll link to is actually specifically about developing the very first feature for this application using TDD. Okay, so I think that gives a pretty good picture of the key differences between these two applications. Obviously, I could always ramble on more about it, but hopefully this has been a somewhat interesting comparison. If you're interested in diving more into these concepts, make sure to check out the links in the description. And of course, if you are really interested, keep an eye out for the revamped course I'll be launching later in the year. If you've already bought my existing building mobile apps with Ionic or creating Ionic applications with Angular books, you will have free access to this course when it launches. So this new course is basically the updated version of the book and where it's going to be maintained in the future. Okay, that's it from me today. I hope you liked the video. I hope you have a great day and I hope that you will subscribe so that I can see you in the next one.